Okay, a couple tutorials about cloners. Um, I will say I recorded something about this before, but uh, it was an older version of Cinema 4D, so the interface has changed. And uh, the audio was really low, which is the volume, so I think I was using a bad microphone, so hopefully this will be better. Uh, I did cover a lot of this in class, so I'm gonna move fairly quickly, but I'm still gonna do this in uh, such a way that I cover this in enough detail. This will probably be two parts. So um, let's jump right in. I just have a default scene. I have a cube. And uh, I'm just going to go ahead and scale the cube, the size down from 200 to just 50 by 50 by 50. I'll just leave that there. OK, so what I want to do is show how we can start to use the cloner. Um, and really, this is. Of all things Cinema 4D, this is the thing it does exceedingly well, is um, use this cloner, which is kind of part of its MoGraph or motion graphics um, tool set. Um, you can get similar results in uh, Blender using geometry nodes, which is powerful, but uh, a little more complicated. And you could use the MASH network, which is a little dated now, but use that within Maya. But uh, Cinema does this really, really well. So I'm just going to create a cloner, which can be found here. All the objects in this menu are cloner types. Um, they create uh, copies of a certain sort, but uh, we're just going to focus on using the cloner. So I, I've created the cloner. Immediately, I have some dots out here in the, um, uh, on the screen. And that's because there's nothing in the cloner itself. So for something to be cloned, it needs to be a child of the cloner. And ta-da! I have um, a little mini grid. So let's look at this in the cloner. So it has a basic and a coordinate tab. Um, transform, I'm not going to cover really in this tutorial, but this would be a way of um, creating offset transformations of various sorts for the clones that are being created. Uh, and then we're going to talk later about the effectors. So well, let's just look at the object tab. Um, the uh, mode here, we can see a grid, right? This little icon even looks like it. There are various sorts. So there's, there's an object that just says, hey, let's put clones on a, a defined object. I can make a linear um, group, right? So here's three or four or five or however many in this. Um, there's a radial array or you know, kind of, I guess what it is, right? It's a, we call this an, a cloner, but it's an array. Um, and then the grid and the honeycomb. So I'm going to stay with the grid for now. Um, I'm going to come back later to talk about this. I'm not going to talk about reset coordinates or the texture stuff. I'm going to just leave it on instance mode. Um, it does have the count, right? So how many uh, copies do I want in this direction or this direction? Um, I'm just going to put that back to three and three. Oops. Three and one and three. <clears throat> and below here we have per step. So this is set up to move it uh, 200 units and every time it does a clone in whatever direction. So we made the, the cube here at 50, right? So I'm going to go back into the cloner and let's just make it 55 per step. I'm going to do this for each. So here's a tight little bundle. The nice thing is this is per step. So if I add more, right, they're still, they still have the same spacing. I'm going to do 10 by 10 like I did in class, right? So that's great, right? I have this little uh, <clears throat> uh, set of cubes. Now, I could create this uh, without the cloner, but it would be a lot of little manual work. And most importantly, if I wanted to make changes, I'd have to go back to the very beginning. Here, uh, there's lots of different ways that I can um, clone. This is just one object. What if I created two objects? So I'm just create a sphere. Um, I'm going to make the radius 25 so that its diameter is 50, which would be the size of the cube itself. And I'm just going to put that in the cloner as well. So you can see I have uh, spheres and I have clones and there's a very organized pattern. And this is because the cloner type um, is to iterate. And iterate just means count through. So um, this would actually be item number zero. This would be item number one. Zero, one, and if there was more, th two, three, four, five, six, right? So this is set up right now to run through this list and, and 
pick this, pick this, pick this, pick this, and it just goes back and forth. So instead of iterate, I'm just gonna choose random. And you can see that the cloner system is now, every time it puts down a queue as it moves through this uh, distribution, um, I get a random result. Now, if you're doing this at home and you set this up, you would probably have the same kind of random seed. Um, my students were talking about this. Um, this is the number that goes into the system that says, hey, this is the specific type of random that I would like. But we can tell it, hey, I'd like, I like this random, but I want a different random. Right? And I get these various random results. Um, but the nice thing about this is, you know, if I get a particular one, I don't want any changes. I want that specific type of randomness. Okay, so that's one thing to note in here. Um, uh, another thing to note is uh, that these are clones, right? So if I go to the cube and down below, if I turn on the fillet command, so basically I want to add a little bevel right to the, the cube. You will make that just two and I'll leave that as three subdivisions. So you can see all these are getting rounded off because that's what's happening with the object that's getting cloned. If I wanted to up the resolution of the, the cubes, right? So, or the spheres, so they're nice and smooth and perfect in there. Right, so this is nice. Um, anything that goes in here will be kind of seen as items that the cloner will pull from, uh, whether it iterates through them or it randomly selects them. It will even, if I put a nothing object in there, right? So um, it's randomly selecting from all three of these. One of them happens to be a null object, which is a nothing object, right? It's a, just a point in space. So if we're looking to break up that um, organization, I can do that. Um, and you know, the other thing too is as far as it counts through here, let's say you do want some gaps to happen, but you don't want that many. Well, let's just duplicate the sphere and duplicate the, oops, duplicate the cube, right? So that we get more chances to select these objects than that object. Okay. Keep adding a few more in here. All right? So uh, there are other ways I could, I could create a clone within a clone and, and all these things, but I just wanted you to see that it's selecting from this population as it puts it in there. Again, I'll go back to the cloner and so many different options, right? So now I have this kind of grid um, of these various objects. So all this is very interesting from just a abstract shape design uh, creation in the, in the system. I'm trying to think if there's anything else I want to mention about the cloner before I uh, delete this. Oh, and then the uh, effector. So let's go back. I'm going to delete all these extra spheres. In fact, I'm going to delete everything but just my cube. And I'm going to make the cloner just one unit tall. Okay. <clears throat> so now I have this grid. I'm just, again, this is all just for demonstration purposes so we can see how this works. So it's nice, but they're all the same. And I don't want to be in a situation where I have to manually create each one of these cubes and make them different from each other so that I would get uh, some randomization in here. I want to use some kind of procedural system to do this, right? And with the cloners, that works, what works basically hand in hand. If you're going to use a cloner, you're most always going to use an effector. So the effector is a way of uh, adding variation of some sort to the clones within the cloning system. Those are all found here um, underneath the deformers, right? And there's a list of these, and uh, I'm not gonna go through all these, but I'm gonna start with the random. Now, when I create this random, you'll see that it uh, has randomized the position of these objects, right? Now, in the cloner itself, there is a, a little effector tab, and you can see that random is in there. In fact, I'm gonna put this as example random, right? So if I go back to the, the cloner, you can see example random is the one that's in here. If for whatever reason, um, you can see I still have the random object here, but nothing is being randomized. So if, if when you create this uh, effector, if you create one of these, and you don't see any changes, that's because you probably didn't have the cloner selected. 
and therefore this effector was not associated with the cloner. No problem, all we need to do is drag and drop it in there, right? To say, hey, let's randomize the position of these clones. Okay, so let's go into the effector for random, and every one of these has a default. Um, uh, so this one, uh, random, has a uh, randomized position turned on. Now, these are turned on with these random values, or with these kind of default values, just so you can see the effector is doing something. Um, in this case, I actually don't want position to change at all. What I would like to change is the scale. So I'm going to turn on scale, and um, there's a couple different ways we could deal with this. Uh, if we put this at uniform and we change the scale, you can see the cubes all remain cubes, but they um, just get bigger or smaller in uh, uh, all three directions. Uh, absolute scale is so that we don't get negative results in here. Um, it's just with, uh, sorry, you can get uh, negative results, but just how it calculates the, the scaling value. I'm going to turn um, that off for now, and I'm going to turn the uniform scale off, and I'm just going to scale this on the Y direction. So you can see that's done. And if I look at my put it back at zero. If I look at the side view, you can see that as I scale the items, they're scaling, um, if they get larger, because of where the uh, pivot, the transform is for the object, when it scales it uh, smaller or larger in that Y direction, it's doing it in both directions, right? Because the pivot is in the center. All right, so let me turn that off for a second. Let's go back and say zero. And, and again, you can see the pivot is right here, if I turn the cloner, for that object, it's right in the center, right? And we made this object, what did we make this? 50 by 50 by 50. So what I want to do is I'm going to move this object up 25 units. And I moved it up 25 because that's half of its overall height. And I'm going to grab a null object, which is coming in at the center of the world, right? I haven't moved the clone. This is very important. I haven't moved the clone. The, or the thing that's going to be cloned, right? That I haven't moved the cube anywhere because the cloner is going to do all that for me. I put a null in, the null object in there, and I'm going to put the cube as a child. The nice thing now is the pivot is down here, which will help with the scaling, at least the way that I want to do it in this case. Right? There are other ways to uh, like offset the transform uh, within the object in this, but this is kind of the old school way. I like to do this, it gives me control, so I know that this is the thing being cloned and it has an object that's all in the positive Y direction. So if I turn on the clone and I'll go back to random, right, and you can see as it's scaling across here that I'm getting everything working, um, scaling up from this direction, right? Because everything's on the positive side of the null object, right? Of where its pivot point is. All right, hopefully that helps there. So uh, let's, let me go back to that. I'm gonna scale this up quite a bit. All right, so that works for me. I like it. So now I have like a little city, right? Um, this is nice. But all of the randomization is affecting everything in the, uh, um, in the cloner system. So what if I want to mask the effect of the effector <laughs> so that it only happens in a certain region? So let's click on the, uh, the effector and, and we have its um, parameters here. There's some settings here in, in, in the effector itself. I'm not gonna talk about that. But uh, parameters, we've already changed a few things here. There's also this thing called fields. Think of fields as a three-dimensional mask. Uh, a gradient that gets, uh, or a sphere, or a, some kind of fall off that gets calculated in three dimensional space. So I'm going to create uh, this uh, very simple one here is a linear field. And so what we can see is that the um, that change is happening based on this mask. So you can see an object here that goes from. Uh, there's a little point here, and then there's an arrow. So this over here would be 0%, and this would be 100%. 100% of what? Whatever that effect is, and of course the effect here is the uh, uh, randomization, right, that's going on with that object.
right? And so if I, whatever that I want that transition to be, right, it can, it can happen like this, all right? So, all right? And if I want to, there, I'll go back to the, uh, um, the parameters here. Um, I can also do with this absolute scale so that I'm keeping everything at one and then I'm just adding to it whatever that absolute is. So just keep in mind, it depends on what you're trying, what you want to do, right? But absolute scale sometimes will help you out. Um, you can see as without that on, if I go greater than one, it's, it starts to scale in a negative direction. All right, so I'm gonna leave that on for this little example. We can see that the, um, the field is moving through here, right? And that changes um, this popping up. So what I'm gonna do is um, keyframe this as a little animation. So I'll select the linear coordinates and for its position, I'll put these keyframes in, uh, I don't know, I'll go to frame 20. And I'll move this all the way through or maybe half the way through. Yeah, I'll leave it right there. And I'll put the keyframes on that. Right. So this is all right. It moves in just uh, a nice, even uh, linear way, right? They grow up to that. But the last piece of this is how can I give a little pop to this as far as an animation? And again, I demonstrated this in class. Um, I would argue that the delay cloner is quickly becoming the favorite of the class or the delay effector. So if I click on cloner here and um, uh, I go up to the effectors again. Here's this delay. So the delay is a little bit different in that um, uh, the effector type, there's different, there's these modes down here. I honestly don't even know what even and blend, how they work. Um, you know, I'm, one of these days I'll probably get into the documentation, but I know uh, that the spring um, mode works uh, very well if you want to get some snappy animation, something that has some overshooting and settling, a bounce basically in it. So let's go back to the beginning, right? I'll let this play through a couple of times. So certainly I do not want to hand animate every single one of those things doing that little jiggle, right, that's in there. And of course, you know, I can play with the, the strength of this. So there's just a little bit And still not, I mean, this is 33%. There's still a little bit there, right? It has a little different effect. And of course, if I really want to go crazy, right? It's like some set of springs, right? Haha, <laughs> that are in there. Okay, uh, last thing, let's see, what do I want to mention here? Where am I at, 18 minutes? Um, within the parameters for the thing that's being affected, if you want to see how it's working, there is a color mode that you can turn on. And this will show you um, the a color representation of what is happening, right? So here is randomized colors of that uh, um, effector. The other color mode would be the field color. So this will show a gradient of what um, the strength of this happening in here. If I were going to the linear field under its color remapping, you can see here's the color. I can actually turn this into a gradient um, if I wanted to, and I could map this out. Let's change that color. Right. So not only is this a good way to see how much the objects are get, being affected, you know, a full red here would be 100% or some gradient across that. In fact, let's go back um, with my linear field in uh, object mode. Right, so you can see I get something a lot more subtle just because of how this is set up. And I'll press play again. Right, so the nice thing is because this is 
procedural, I'm using these tools to do all the animation, I can iterate, I can try different things to see uh, how it's working. Okay, so that's just the nuts and bolts of that. I'm gonna come back and do uh, a couple more variations on this idea, um, like I did in class, but uh, let's just recap. We can put multiple objects into the clone. Uh, we can clone in uh, different patterns. We always can go back and change uh, the, uh, the objects that are being cloned, and that will uh, be uh, changed uh, throughout the whole system. And I can use the effectors with these masks, these fields, to limit where this effect is uh, being applied to the system. Okay, 20 minutes of cloner goodness. I'll be back with part two soon.